Welcome to Five Good Questions. I'm your host, Jake Taylor. Our guest today is Professor Aswath Damaradran. Professor Damaradran holds the Kirshner Family Chair in Finance Education and is Professor of Finance at New York University Stern School of Business. Before coming to Stern, he also lectured in finance at the University of California, Berkeley. He's been voted Professor of the Year by the graduating MBA class five times during his career at NYU and was profiled in Business Week as one of the top 12 U.S. business school professors. He currently teaches corporate finance and equity instruments and markets, and his research interests include information and prices, real estate, and valuation. Today we're going to be discussing his book, Narrative and Numbers, The Value of Stories in Business. Professor Demudron is a recognized expert in valuation. Let's ask him five good questions. All right, welcome back to the show, everybody. My guest today is Aswath Damodaran, author of Narrative and Numbers. Hey, Aswath, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you for having me on. Um, as I told you before we kind of got started, uh, I've been a long time admirer of your evaluation work, and um, I've, I think it's uh, it's always logical to me, and um, and that's not always true for a lot of uh, evaluation stuff that I see. So I, I appreciate uh, your contributions and uh, your, your role as a teacher at uh, NYU. Thank you. Thank you. So let's jump right in. Uh, question number one, why is access to increased data and computing power kind of ironically made us more dependent and maybe even susceptible to storytelling? Because I think that we're more done by, so we, we suffer from information overload in everything, in sports, in politics, and everywhere. You look at politics, there are a dozen polls every day in sports, there are so many statistics that hit us, that at some point the human mind says, okay, I'm going to switch off. So strangely, the more we get more down by numbers, the less we trust them. And let's face it, we've all been taken to the cleaners by somebody using numbers, right? That old saying of, you know, liars lie and statistics lie most of all. We've seen how people use numbers selectively to try to get their points across. So we just don't trust numbers anymore. Hmm. And uh, so question number two, and this is kind of a good segue, is what makes numbers so powerful? Uh, And and maybe how do we guard against being fooled by some of these practitioners and and, uh, that use numbers against us? And maybe even more importantly, how do we keep from fooling ourselves with numbers? I think they're powerful because they intimidate us. I mean, starting at a young age, when you see lots of numbers on a page, your sense is this person must know what they're doing. So I think the first problem with numbers is most of us are not that comfortable with numbers. And we can trace it back to how numbers are taught to us in middle school and high school. They're taught as these these, these the the almost mysterious things that have a life of their own. So I think most of us are not that comfortable with numbers and we're not very comfortable with statistics. One of my pet peeves is how badly we teach statistics, not just at the college level, but that we don't even try at the high school level because I think every American, every human being needs to at least get the basics of statistics nailed down. And if you don't, it's so easy to look at those numbers and say, I have no idea what's going on. Yeah, you're kind of, uh, as maybe as Charlie Munger would say, you're a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest. <laughs> exactly, or, or the, the old legend of the left brain and the right brain holds, we're using half our brains. And it's tough enough operating with your whole brain, but if you use only half your brain, I think it's even more difficult to actually operate in this universe. Mm. So question number three, uh, there seems to be this competition amongst a lot of investment firms of who has the most unbiased process and is kind of the most quantitatively driven. What are some potential shortcomings of being so quant focused? The fundamental premise is wrong, right? The, the premise is if you're using numbers, you must be objective. And as somebody who uses numbers all the time, it's amazing how much bias you can put into numbers. <laughs> and this is the way I describe, describe the difference. When a storyteller is biased, you know he's biased because it's a fancy tale, it's a fairy tale. When a number cruncher is biased, you have no idea how biased he is and where he or she hides it. So I think it's actually a more dangerous bias because it looks like it's not biased, but bias is hidden somewhere in the numbers. So I think that these investment firms that tell you, hey, we're unbiased, look, we're using numbers, I'd be doubly careful with their numbers because I think they're just hiding their biases. Hmm. So what, uh, what's the kind of right mixture then potentially of, of story or narrative along with numbers? And I think that, and that's why I wrote this book. I think the right pushback is to not fight them on the numbers. And what, what I mean by not fighting them on the numbers, 
is when they say the revenue growth is 25%. If you argue about the number, you're playing on their field. Basically, you're saying, why not 23? Why not 27? The question you got to ask them is, what do you think is so great about this company that's going to allow it to grow at 25% in a market that's mature? So if you tell me that an automobile company, Volkswagen, is going to have 25% growth, I'm going to say, where's that growth coming from? Is it getting it from other auto companies? Is it coming up with some new market? Tell me where the growth is coming from. And that's the part that introduces discipline to the process, because if somebody is not able to give you a good story as to why it's 25%, I would throw that valuation out. Right. <clears throat> so question number four, um, one of the things I really liked about your book was that it was just chock full of these pretty amazing insights on what seemed like to me a lot of the, the biggest uh, and most interesting stories in the investment world over the last few years, um, whether it was Amazon and Uber, Valiant, Ferrari, GoPro, Yahoo, Vail. Um, Let's take one interesting example and maybe unpack it a little bit to kind of give people an idea of the numbers and the narrative that impacted Uber. Right. Let's take Uber. I mean, the first time I heard about Uber was in June of 2014 when they raised money from venture capitalists who priced them at $17 billion. And I'll make a confession. I don't take cabs. I don't take car service. I take the subway. I knew very little about Uber. So when I first sat down to value Uber, the first question I had to answer for myself to build the story is, what does this company do? And I was told it was a ride-sharing company. And basically, that became the construct for my first valuation of Uber. I treated it as an urban car service company. You think, so what? If you treat Uber as an urban car service company, the market it's going after are big cities, cab service, car services, and big markets. So when I valued Uber, that became my total market, and that drove the valuation out of Uber. The pushback I got from people who loved Uber was, hey, it's not a car service company, it's a logistics company. Words of consequences, right? When you say it's a logistics company, you're expanding the business it's going to be in. It could be in moving, it could be in delivery. You all of a sudden triple the market, which essentially increases the value of the company. One of the things I get out of Uber is, if you're a founder of a startup and you're describing your company, the words you use to describe your company can make the difference between you, whether your company is valued as a $100,000 company or a $100 million company. In fact, if you watch Travis Kalatnik, the CEO of Uber, describe Uber, he never describes it as a car service company. He describes it as a transportation company, a logistics company. Essentially, he's, he's painting this big canvas of we're going to be everything everywhere. And that comes with pluses and minuses. The plus is you now have this huge market. People attach a high price to you. The minus is you've also set up this potential to disappoint people. You're going to be distracted. In fact, I tell people to contrast Uber with Lyft because they're, in a sense, in the same business, but they're very different visions. Uber has this big vision. They want to be in transportation. They want to be in delivery. Lyft is going to be just a car service company just in the U.S., Uber has a much higher pricing in the market because it has a much bigger vision. Lyft, I think, has a less risky business proposition because it's going after a smaller market. So in a sense, every time you hear about a company, CEOs are going to be tempted to give you the big story. But that big story comes with this trade-off of can you actually deliver on that story because you might be able to get that high number up front, but you might not be able to deliver the other pieces that make that story work. Right, so you're, you you paint the big narrative to get a big valuation on a on an equity raise, let's say, but then all right, now what? <laughs> We've got to figure exactly. out how to deliver on this. Exactly, and very few companies are able to. Facebook obviously did. Twitter was not able to. Snap is a lab experiment in process. We're going to see whether it's going to be able to do it, but I think it's this 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 constant tension between I want to make my company look like the biggest company in the face of the earth versus, hey, can I actually deliver the stuff that makes my company the valuable company that I want it to be? Yeah, when you're looking at Uber, did um, to kind of bring up a broader point, you know, everyone always assumes to to be very conservative with their numbers. Um, do you think that sometimes people are overly conservative and and too yeah. constrained on on maybe what the potential upside of something could be? I've never understood this 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 argument that you should be conservative in the numbers because what people are saying it's better to come up with too low a value than too high a value. And I don't see that. I remember my statistics where I was taught type 1 errors versus type 2 errors. And even if you've forgotten statistics, type 1 errors are when you do things you shouldn't do. 
type two errors are when you don't do things when you sh that you should do. When you're too conservative, what you've done is you've reduced your likelihood of type one errors. You're not buying stocks that you shouldn't be buying, but you're also avoiding stocks that you should be buying. And to me, I think that is the trade-off you have to think about. You can be conservative, but if you're too conservative, you're going to just hold, end up holding cash in your portfolio, never buying a stock because you want that absolute sure thing. And in my experience in the market, there is no such thing as an absolute sure thing in the market. You have to be willing to live with the downside to get the upside. Hmm. I agree. Uh, so question number five. What do you think is the one narrative today that's likely to eventually cause the most pain over the next three to five years, let's say, just to put a little I, constraint on it? I, I'll give you a depressing narrative. It's got nothing to do with companies. It's got to do with countries. Hmm. We're on a cusp of a global transition where what we're seeing is the emerging markets are rising, whether they rise at what rate we can, you're going to see Asia and Latin America rise. And while the world's not a fixed pie, the pie is not growing that much. And the downside of the emerging markets emerging from the ashes is something's got to give. And what you're seeing, I think, is the beginning of not just a slowdown, but perhaps negative growth in the, for the long term for Europe, Japan, and perhaps even the US. So at the core of that argument is, so when you think through that, it comes with consequences. It's a negative story because it's going to percolate down, not just into company valuations, but into the things that you're going to see on a day-to-day -day basis. We're going to have to do less, more with less. And you're already seeing this. The generation, the next generation is not going to be as prosperous as this one. And politically, that's going to come with the kind of blowback you saw last year with Brexit and the presidential election. Is This is going to be a painful time because it's so much easier making decisions with a growing pie than with a shrinking pie. And I have a feeling that in half the world, especially the developed part of the world, we're going to be facing a shrinking pie going forward. And that's going to kind of affect everything we do as investors, as consumers, as taxpayers. Yeah, and that's, um, that's a big shift from the last, call it, you know, 120, tw yeah, exactly. I mean, especially the, you know, 20th century was a growing pie, which allowed us to borrow more than we, you know, would be able to now. Uh, we were able to, it's a whole different world. Yeah, and you always expected income to go up. As you aged, you thought, I'm going to make more money 10 years from now than now. The next generation is going to be better off than I. That feeling, I think, is slipping away from Americans and with good reason. Hmm. <clears throat> so there, that narrative that they feel then uh, is not really wrong. It's they may be right, and it's it's bad. <laughs> I think they're actually the ones who are getting it. I think what the people are not getting it are the big macroeconomists and the experts saying, "What are you so worried about?" I think people at the, uh, at, at the ground level get the fact that something is shifting away from them and they're sensing it. And that's what you see playing out in politics and economics and markets right now. Hmm. Fascinating. So bonus question we always ask, um, and this is for a book recommendation, and it's usually something that uh, you think is kind of under the radar or maybe hasn't gotten the due that it deserves. Uh, what do you have for us today? Yeah. I have two suggestions. One is actually, um, you know, I, I love Moneyball, Michael Lewis's book, which is a book that you've probably seen the movie of. Mm -hmm. I would suggest go back and rereading it, not as a baseball book, but as a book about the clash between number crunchers and storytellers. Because in that book, you know who wins. The number crunchers win. But I would suggest then following up and looking to see how many World Series the Oakland A's have won since 2003. I know the answer but, to that. It's zero. <laughs> and, and I think you'd see the same thing playing out with sabermetrics. Uh, I think people have gotten so caught up with big data that they've forgotten the fact that if the story doesn't work, that ultimately there is a need. We need storytellers. I would also suggest, um, you, know, uh, you know, any of the books on The Madness of Crowds. This is an old book. It's from the last century. And um, it, there are versions of it, shorter versions, essentially about how the tulip bulb craze and the South Sea bubble, old bubbles. And it talks about how these bubbles percolated from individuals to markets. In the old days, the way you, tra you put out a rumor is you went to a pub and you would very loudly say something. You'd act like you were drunk. And you'd spill the fact that the stock was going to go up and all of a sudden everybody would come in. 
And when I when I read about this, my my vision is CNBC takes on the same form. Now, <laughs> That's you the want bar. To, so you go. It's the equivalent of a pub. And the problem is you have a much bigger audience. So it's going to be easier for bubbles to form and kind of explode in a market like this than 300 years ago. And that's something worth keeping in mind. It's not like we've become more rational over time. We're still the same human beings. But now we have the capacity to create a lot more damage than we did 100 or 200 years ago. So I would suggest both the Michael Lewis book and The Madness of Crowds because they're kind of polar opposites in terms of where they come from, of how numbers can sometimes mislead you. But they're well worth reading. Do you, do you think that we're in a bubble right now? I don't know. And and I think I'll tell you why. Because the word bubble suggests hubris because it says I am the sensible one. The rest of the world is crazy. So I'm going to tell. So when you use the word bubble, you're already putting yourself on a pedestal, right? <laughs> yeah. You say, I am the smart one. And I've discovered, especially after the last few years, that when you're an expert and you put yourself on a pedestal in this market, it's almost like you're asking to be taken down. The gods are waiting for you. So I try not to use the word bubble. I say, look, I don't understand what's going on. That doesn't mean that what's going on doesn't make sense. So my valuations are for my own consumption. I don't push them on other people. I don't try to talk people out of investing in something. It is, I think, their decision to make. And I'm a great believer that to be an investor, you've got to take ownership of your decisions. Ultimately, it has to be your decision, not Goldman Sachs telling you to do something or me telling you to do something. It's you telling yourself, this is the right thing for me to do. Well, you know what? I think that's a great place to, to wrap things up. Uh, Aswa, thank you for coming on and uh, it was a real pleasure. You're welcome, thank you. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this interview. If you'd like to support this author and purchase their book, click here. If you'd like to become a subscriber to 5GQ, click here. And I included a couple other interviews that you might appreciate right here. Thanks, happy reading.